March 31st at 9.30, we'll have the Resurrection Sunday uh, early service, and then follow that, we have uh, uh, breakfast together downstairs, and then after that will be the uh, morning service. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, let's do our verses together, Second John 1, the elder yeah, unto the, the elect lady, lady and her children, children who I love, love the truth, and, and not, not only, only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, truth and love. All right, let's sing our first hymn together. Let's stand together, more like my Savior.
I'll be reading verses 26 through 32, Luke chapter 23. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to put to cross, or put to death. We're going to stop there, because I'm kind of inching our way to the Resurrection Sunday. And may God bless us as we look at this portion of Scripture. And as we go to prayer this morning, obviously, we have some folks that are out, uh, ongoing problems. We have uh, Louise, who uh, has all sorts of difficulties with arthritis and uh, a knee that has to be mended and things like that. So um, continue to pray for her. Uh, pray for Jimmy, and uh, as he encourages his children and others, um, and uh, for Jared, as he makes the transition uh, to Florida. Uh, you folks don't know him, but he was a really nice guy, um, a Jewish person that was saved here. Not here, but God saved and came to this church. And uh, by virtue of his friend Matthew, who was a little old, interesting. But um, so he, he built, has a business in Florida now. And Dylan is one of our college students in uh, Texas A&M. Pray for him. And uh, 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 Gerard as well. And uh, Continue to pray for uh, Kathy, who is uh, Janet's sister. Pray for Alan Janet, of course, and their family. And pray for Matt and Mary. Um, pray for Mary because they've never really come up with a reason why she had this intestinal bleed. So, um, and, uh, so that's a problem. And pray for Matt as well. Um, continue to pray for Keith and Elaine. And uh, Elaine is headed for something big, right? Cataracts. What's, what's on your docket? Doctor. Well, I'm seeing my a doctor on Tuesday. They don't know if they can do my cataract surgery because I'm coughing too much. Oh, well, you got to stop coughing. <laughs> they don't want me coughing when I have yeah, cataract No, that doesn't go well when you're shaking no, your head, no. right? So I'm going to get a, try to get a clearance on Tuesday. If not, we'll have to postpone it. All right. We'll pray for them. In the military, they just use a big vice. <laughs> but that's, that's the military. Um, can you pray for Chester and for Miriam, of course, down in Brazil, and for Ronnie in New Jersey, and our missionaries, Stefan and Rebecca, as they uh, travel to uh, prepare themselves for pre-field, or prepare themselves for language school as they head to um, Peru. Peru, yeah, okay. He's going to be teaching at the seminary there. And Jonathan and his wife as they serve in Japan. Pray for prayer, please. Bill leaves on Friday. My son in law Bill leaves for a mission's trip to um, somewhere. <laughs> I forget the name of it. <laughs> Mine just went blank. It's not the Dominican Republic, is it? Yes, it is. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Um, um, you can pray for me. I have an echocardiogram tomorrow, and um, uh, I have something that's not working. It doesn't. S My heart pumps it in, but doesn't like to give it back. So whatever that technical, Matt and Mary here, they didn't have a phrase for it, but it's probably a valve or something. My, my, my family, my father's family have a long history of bad hearts. Good, good hearts, but bad. <laughs> but, um, so but it's all in the Lord's hand. I'm not worried about it, you know, and uh, other things. So we can just pray for each other and our kids. And uh, we're thankful to have uh, this fellow here playing piano. He's a little shy, but his name is Shy Sean. <laughs> Jordan. Jordan, yeah. Who's Sean? 
Oh, that's my son, my uh, nephew that I have to do a wedding for. So, sorry about that, Jordan. <laughs> Margaret uh, told me that Jordan, because we have a nephew, Jordan, so it's easy to remember. I have to try to remember the rest of your, you have one kid missing, right? Yeah. Okay. School project. Okay, good, good, good. We'll, we'll pray for him. What's his name? Sam. Sam and? Leia. Leia. And? Luke. Luke. Okay, I'll get him done. So, um, probably within the year anyway. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity again to come, uh, first with freedom, uh, without fear of uh, anything uh, interfering with us. Uh, we know, Father, that perhaps this might change as uh, the world gets worse, especially our country, Father. We pray, Lord, for uh, the, the goings on and leadership and all that stuff, Father, that obviously thy will be done. And that's where we end it, Father, as far as our concern or worry. We know you're in complete control. And so, Father, we uh, just go before you with humble hearts, knowing, Father, that uh, you have a plan for each one of us. And uh, we, we do have some older folks that aren't doing well, and we pray for them, Lord. We pray that you would intercede for them, Louise and uh, Gerard with his back. We pray for Jimmy and his uh, opportunities to encourage all his kids and grandkids. And we pray for Jarrett and uh, uh, pray that he finds a good church down where he's living now. And we pray for Alan Janet's family, especially for Kathy. And, um, we pray for their grandkids and uh, we pray for Mary and uh, Lord that you would uh, be with her. We're thankful to see her last Sunday. We pray that you would help her as far as her ongoing needs and that as well. And of course for Keith and Elaine, we continue to pray for them and uh, Give the doctors wisdom as they try to help Elaine and for Keith as well as he goes for speech therapy and other things. Pray for Chester, Father, that you would just uh, be with him and uh, Lord, that you would just do work in his life as well and all the serious problems that he's experiencing. And we uh, remember Miriam, Father, and even as we now speak, she's either actively involved in her church or watching us. We pray for Ronnie and that you would just continue to bless her hoping that you find another Christian friend to be friends with. And uh, Stephan and Rebecca, as they serve you on what we would call pre-field ministries, as they uh, gain the support to go to language school and then off to seminary down in Brazil or Peru. And uh, Jonathan, as he acquires the Japanese language and his, his wife and him minister there in that village, Father, you would uh, bless them as they team up with the ABW missionaries as well. Now, Father, for the moments we have left, help us to worship you, Father, with a pure heart and mind, well, hoping and willing that the Holy Spirit would uh, bless us and uh, uh, direct us, Father, as we embrace your word. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, another hymn together. On the old rugged cross. You can remain seated for that. <clears throat>
Let's pray together. Father, we're again thankful for your word. We pray, Father, as uh, we explore this uh, short text, Father, that you would uh, illuminate our eyes, uh, give us uh, a direction as we approach this uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday and the significance of all the things that are recorded in your word, Father, that we might take note of and uh, uh, that we might grow closer to you because of this. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if it would be, um, or I'd be capable of being able to describe the forensics of uh, the uh, last day. Uh, last week we looked at his scourging and uh, his humiliation and all these things. We kind of look at it uh, based on what the scriptures tell us, but uh, what you have to keep in mind is uh, that Jesus, who was God, came into his own creation and was willing to suffer if, as if we were suffering. None of the pain was dead because of who he was. And uh, so uh, th there have been uh, copious pages written about the trying to understand or relate to what Jesus was feeling. Matter of fact, I, I made a list of the possibilities of uh, things that he went through. And, uh, you know, uh, starting with the selection, um, I think I might have mentioned that Pilate was hoping if he picked this guy Barabbas, that they certainly would go with Jesus because this guy was destined for the crucifixion because he was a murderer and a thief, insurrectionist. He was just a bad guy, and both Pilate and Herod came to the same conclusion that Jesus was innocent of whatever phony char charges they had. But of course, political pressure seems to take uh, hold of this, and uh, uh, Pilate, for fear of a riot and uh, displeasure, matter of fact, hope, uh, hoping that this would quell their lust for um, death, that he would escape the pressures from Rome because of this. That, that's my own understanding of what I've read thus far, that uh, we find that um, both men, Herod and Pilate, were appointed by Rome. Either one were Jews, and uh, they couldn't care less about them, but they cared a lot about their positions. Kind of like our government today. We have people on both sides that are just happy to make all the money, and they pretend like they care about you, but by the bottom line is they're always trying to protect their own uh, positions. But uh, um, the great emotional stress um, sometimes is uh, depicted as we uh, look at the passage. And uh, uh, beginning in the Garden of Eden, uh, and the Bible says in Luke 22, 44, that uh, when he sweat, became like great drops of blood. I did some research, and you probably have heard this before. There is a, 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 a process called hematidrosis, 
which uh, may occur in highly emotional states or in persons with bleeding disorders as a result of the hemorrhage of the sweat glands and the sweat becomes fragile and tender. Now this is a guy named Edwards who was a MD but a theologian as well. Uh, not to say that that's exactly what happened because the description we find in scripture is that he he sweated as if it were great drops of blood. So um, either way, uh, what we're not looking at necessarily the blood issue is the pressure of that what he was going through. Anybody ever been in some real high pressure events in life? You know how it feels. Your heart goes up. Um, I've had two occasions that stick in my mind. One was uh, in my last church we had a rogue deacon that was uh, uh, I was his target, and for a couple of days. You know, I had a lot of anxiety and my heart was racing because I'm not sure exactly what was happening here. Uh, the church solved it by asking him to uh, go out the back door. But the other one was when I um, was in between ministries and I needed to work. So I went to a school to learn how to drive tractor trailer and did really well in school. But the bottom line is you got to pass the test. And uh, so that was a stressful experience because... You know, everything was riding on that, you know. So uh, you, you might think, well, that, those are minor things and it seems to be kind of more material than anything else. But um, when, I, when I hear about people with stress, that's the only thing I can fall back on, uh, understanding how, f how it affects you physiologically. You know, your heart rate, your blood pressure goes up and stuff like that. And uh, in this case, Jesus not only uh, had that pressure, but... In, in the relationship between his disciples, we find that uh, after Gethsemane, they all kind of scatter. Now, Peter was the one that denied Christ. He was also the one that said he would die with Christ. And so you have this kind of disappointment. Now, some people will say that in Jesus' case, he's omniscient. So he knew all these things. But still, you know, uh, my response to that is that's true. But sometimes we know what's going to happen and we still be, are affected by the emotions, the stress of the event that's happening. And uh, uh, when Hebrews talks about he was a good high priest to us because he could understand us, it helps us to understand that he, he knows how we feel when we're going through difficulties in life and the concerns that we have. Now, I'll tell you right now that uh, the Bible has a solution to anxiety. And so if you're worried about something, you're failing to exercise that right you have as a believer to cast all your care upon him. Now that doesn't remove the thought of what was happening, but that does um, spread the load out. You know, um, insurance companies do that all the time. They'll buy, you buy insurance from them, but the, uh, what could happen, they take that and spread it to other insurance companies so that when it, the hurricane comes, all these people pay into it. And uh, um, Raj taught me that from his business. But in this case, we find that uh, it's, it's good for us to understand that uh, what Jesus went through, he felt uh, as if we were there. And he took our place. And uh, uh, in that moment of time, that would be an eternity for us. So, uh, you know, imagine the difficulty that he had went through. Uh, Jesus suffered emotional stress. He suffered, obviously, physical uh, stress as well and uh, so uh, that brings us to where we are now as far as uh, uh, as we're walking toward Calvary uh, after enduring a long night of betrayal and false ac accusations Jesus was brought before Pilate again sent to stand before Herod and we all went through all of that as well now the picture up there is a picture of Via Dolores Dolores Rosa Dolores 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 okay um, obviously my language in English isn't that good. I wanted to show it to you because of the narrowness of this picture. Because the, uh, Jesus didn't carry the cross. He carried the cross beam. Uh, from uh, antiquity, the cross, uh, these were permanently in the ground in Golgotha. And so the cross beam is what he would be, uh, his hands would be nailed to. So that beam he had to carry. Now one professor that I remember said that Prior to this event, the Lord was probably in really good shape. He traveled walking all the way, all around. He was a carpenter, which 
And our definition would be uh, mason carpenter because they did a lot of work with rocks as well. So he was in good shape. But what he went through after the garden really took a, a, a beating on him to the point where he might not have been able to carry that beam. Probably he did because the passage implies that as soon as they left, they constricted this guy Simon. And uh, so we're going to look at that. So uh, the first thing I want to share with you is the delegation that followed him. Uh, this is an interesting observation from uh, both the biblical perspective and, you know, the opinions of uh, scholars, etc., and our own opinions as well. If you go back to the uh, day when he came down into Jerusalem on the donkey, there were crowds there yelling, Hosanna, you know, God, and all that stuff, and throwing down uh, palm branches. I think Palm Sunday is coming up. In some of the bigger churches, the Catholic, and though they give you palm branches. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see really the need of that, but if you wanted one, I guess you could go south, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, the significance of that worship, that same crowd, uh, as being paid by the uh, Pharisees and the high priests, then turned their song to crucify him. So mingled in this, though, uh, and I think it's significant in the passage that... Um, Luke, Dr. Luke says this, and I'll read it for you here in a second. It says, as they led him away, they laid hold of one Simon. So you have a, an episode there where on their way, uh, going through this passage here, and I, I believe it's a, a two and a half to three mile trek. And the reason why they did it, I think I said this last week, is because they wanted all the people to see that these criminals were getting what they deserved. And uh, uh, so uh, going along this passage probably was difficult. Um, some believe that the, the cross beam was, had to be at least six feet or eight feet uh, long, hewed out of a log, you know, rough wise and uh, fairly heavy. Uh, but uh, we find in the passage there that Simon is here. So the Cyrenian, uh, that's the, that today's Libya today, there was a great Jewish population there. So I guess the, um, the uh, I don't want to call it a guess, but I remember reading an article about the Simon and who he was. Now, uh, he is mentioned, and his sons were mentioned, Alexander and somebody else. I think I have it down here. Um, Alexander and Rufus were believers and part of the church. Uh, so the question was, was this man there? And was saved or this came afterwards as he went back to his hometown it's an interesting read but um, you have to kind of take history with a grain of salt because it, the conclusion is always you know I imagine and this is my opinion that that impact that it had him and he was there and was uh, probably aware of who Jesus was even though there's some consensus to say well 800 miles away uh, maybe he would never heard of them, but you know, every every um, year for Passover they travel so back and forth. So uh, from the Passover that Jesus was born uh, till then, that's thirty some years of uh, this information being passed. So there's a good possibility that he might have known who he was. It doesn't say that he was there hand hold of his hand. It says that you know they laid hold of him. That's the word seized. So they grabbed him. They probably looked him over and said he probably could carry it. The interesting thing, or the observation I think that's good to share, is that what happened was that now Simon would carry the crossbeam for Jesus, but follow behind Jesus. So Jesus still had to go. And uh, you know the phrase, take up your cross and follow Jesus? You know, I think that Simon probably uh, somewhere in his future understood that. And I think it's an interesting thing for us as well. Now, there's another uh, tidbit that I think I wanted to share with you. And uh, um, I have a leaky tap here. Just excuse me for a minute. I guess I can still read it, even though it's kind of stuffy. But um, Barabbas, that was his cross beam, and Jesus took it. I'm thinking about that. And I can take Grabus's name and put my name there. That was my cross beam that he took. And uh, uh, some believe that Barabbas maybe came to Christ later. You know, there's no evidence to that. But certainly, even Barabbas understood the, the innocence of the Savior. And, uh, you know, 
Um, when you think about the world today and how difficult it is and how uh, downright pagan it is, uh, the Word of God can change anyone's life. Now, his presence there, I feel, falls under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. You know, I understand sovereignty because everything that happens to us, God has his hand in, you know, and uh, uh, so Simon was there for the right reason. And perhaps him going back to Libya and sharing this news, that's where Alexander Roof would come from. And that's as far as I can go because history does not reveal this, but um, I believe that, that more than likely that's what happened. Uh, so um, Acts chapter 13, and uh, this is just the, the follow through with that. I should have read it for you first. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, and, which was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Maim, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Some believe that this was the same man who helped Jesus bear the cross. The spelling is different, but spelling is really a relative, irrelative thing because spelling changes over the centuries. Um, so that's, that's a possibility. I just wanted to throw that out for you to kind of consider. Now let's think about the company, verse 27. And there followed a great company of people. Um, and among them uh, were women who were mourning and wailing for him. So now we have a picture of this crowd, and not everybody was cheering and happy that he was being killed. Uh, these women, and I think you can probably trace their path with Christ. Many of those women were with him right from the beginning. Even his mother was there, and uh, they were the ones that made things happen for the disciples in Christ. They had to eat, they had to sleep, they had to have their clothes mended. You know, I'm just uh, making this up in my head, but in reality, uh, this is something that was a day-to-day -day thing. If we had a church dinner and we didn't have any women, you know what we'd have? Coffee and Pop-Tarts, maybe. <laughs> if we remember, uh, most of the programs that churches have, usually uh, the, the, it's facilitated by the women, you know, and that's not to say that that's right or wrong, but that's kind of the pattern we see in the New, New Testament church as well. And, uh, uh, but Jesus had a special message for them because they were certainly um, uh, wailing, it says, and lamenting uh, this great thing, this company. So uh, many were there to ensure that he was going to die, and some were there in support of Jesus, desiring to be near him as long as they could. Um, can't even imagine the scene that day. No doubt, many were shouting at Jesus. Some were mocking him. We understand from other passages that some were saying, you know, if you're really the Son of God, come down off the cross, you know, and all that. Um, so we, we kind of get a picture of what's happening. But sometimes you neglect the fact that there were there those people that were there that loved Jesus, that believed that he was the Messiah, and wanted to be near him no matter what. And... Uh, uh, they were the women. The disciples were hiding somewhere. They were the cowards. Uh, so let's consider the conduct that they had. Uh, they followed him uh, in this great company. Imagine that with thousands of people trying to get through here, behind, I guess, maybe even in front. Now, it's not always that narrow, but there it is that that's the narrowest part that I believe I could find. And uh, uh, that's an older picture, probably from the 20s or 30s. But uh, if you go to Jerusalem, that place is still there. It's famous. They even have a sign that says the name, so if you don't remember what it was. And I think if you go during Passover, it's crowded because people make that walk. It would be kind of significant to do that, wouldn't you think? I'd like to do that, you know, other than the fact that I'd be worried about rockets flying and um, all, all those other things that happen there. Uh, Luke, Dr. Luke reveals they bewailed and lamented. This shows their strong emotion and utter grief during the proceedings. Um, their bewailing has the idea of striking or beating one's body, particularly in the breast with the hands. Uh, this is an outward display of inner grief. We have a description of that in the Old Testament. A lot of times when they were grieving or repenting, they would rip their clothes and sitting in the ash pile. You know, when they had fires, there was ashes, so ashes were everywhere. So it wasn't like you had to go down to the store to buy a bag of ashes. It was all over the place. 
uh, but it was an outward sign. Uh, it's interesting that the Pharisees had to pretend to be bad, uh, sad. So they would uh, paint their faces to look sad. That's where we get the word for pharmacology in Greek. Uh, they would, they would, what'd you say, Mom? Cosmetology. Yeah, but it's, it comes out of the pharmacology part, the chemicals. I'm almost positive, so well, you could be right as well. But they would pretend to be sad, but they really weren't. In this case, we find that women were genuine. We were at, we were at, we were, without regard to their own uh, uh, well-being there. Uh, so let's think about the declaration for the future. This is what Jesus uh, talks to the women. And uh, it says, Jesus turning unto them said, come on in. That's okay, Louise. I'm the one who told you to use the back steps. <laughs> See, it's easier. It's only four steps. Now, when you look at the words that Jesus speaks, you can look at them like prophetic, uh, because uh, obviously it was that eventually Rome was going to just wipe out Israel. They were going to be scattered. But you could carry that farther in prophecy all the way to the millennial kingdom. And you'll, you can see that as you trace this. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Um, which kind of is a strange thing because he was the one going on the cross, but Jesus is seeing the bigger picture. But weep for yourselves and your children. For behold, the days were, are coming in which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear children. And they shall begin to say to the mountains, fall on us. Now this is a prophetic picture of the tribulation period where the uh, unbelieving Jews that are left after the rapture of the church, many of them, if not uh, a great majority of Jewish people will embrace the Messiah and go through that terrible point of the tribulation. And uh, to the point where some were saying that the, they were hoping the mountains would fall on us and to the hills to cover us. For if they do these things to a green tree, what he's saying is if they do it to Jesus, the innocent one, um, what will happen to the dry? Uh, you know, so he's using this kind of parallelism, uh, looking at what uh, the audacity of crucifying Christ uh, what's going to happen to the guilty. Now, that even is uh, an implication. Rome is the one that's going to wipe out Israel, but behind Rome is God himself. The students, the uh, students, the, my class downstairs in Ezekiel, we're saying that God is going to judge Israel and Judah, and uh, the visions that Ezekiel has, uh, we see these angels and stuff doing that, but behind the scenes, or the reality for the Jews, is the Babylonians are the ones that are going to come. So Jesus uh, doesn't, or God does not uh, not use pagans to carry his will out as well, which is another understanding of how God is sovereign. Uh, so let's talk about the compassion for a moment. You know, Jesus is uh, uh, concerned about these ladies. And uh, as Jesus heard their lament, uh, he was moved to speak to them. Uh, this actually, other than the seven last words he speaks on the cross, is the last communication he has with anybody. And he directs it to the ladies that are there. And uh, there's some position to this. It was probably Mary and Mary Magdalene and Joanna and um, um, Naomi, Salome. Salome, and others that were at the tomb, and others that were there as far as I understand. And uh, so these ladies were constantly serving the Lord, and God gives them, or Jesus gives them a little bit of information about uh, the tragedy and what's going to happen to them as well. The caution is where Jesus speaks a word of caution to the women, and all who would hear those words of caution, we discover uh, one, I'm catching up to my notes, sorry about that, but the prophecy, uh, you know, that I read, and this refers to the dreadful time yet future when the Antichrist will appear on the scene. Just by a by note, um, he's probably already here. Because I think we're that close. I could be dead wrong as well. But uh, the, how small the world is getting and this great push to digitize the money is a big part of what was going to happen in the tribulation period. Uh, so but some of the things that we're seeing happening now are going to be... Um, 
part of that that part of the narrative of the tribulation. So we're seeing things that you know uh, we're really close. Matter of fact, if you need to go to the hearing doctor to get a hearing aid, um, you know you might want to do that. But I think that the trump is going to be so loud that uh, all believers will hear. Of course, that's the truth that will, will happen. But let's talk about the intensity and found in verse thirty. Um, then shall they begin to say to the mountain. So there's this, uh, uh, in this little conversation, he was kind of giving them uh, a, a bucket list of things that their, they and their future uh, relatives are going to experience during this time of uh, tragedy. Um, all right, number three. <clears throat> Last thing. Amen. We've got 15 minutes to get through this. Timing, right? I, I went over last week, so if I go a little under, you'll be all right, right? <laughs> if not, I can make up a point four, but I don't want to do that. Let's talk about the description of the felons, because this will carry us into next week. And uh, uh, verse 32, there were also two other malefactors. Criminals, basically, is the word. Led with him to put to death. So I imagine the picture is that Jesus... Maybe they were in their positions, and uh, so they were to walking together. Um, that's the only description we get from there. And we're not going to go any farther because that's coming up. But the character is described that they're literally uh, evildoers. It speaks of the malicious character they possessed. Now, you have to understand one thing about Rome. Rome was harsh, but Rome had justice as well. They had a political and a uh, a system that worked for them and uh, they were just like in our country today the worst usually get the chair or the needle if that ever happens but uh, you know that's reserved for the worst of uh, society the murderers and stuff like that but their description uh, they were henuous uh, men they, they, convicted, they were convicted of terrible crimes against society as they crucified or uh, were on the Calvary's Hill or Golgotha, Jesus will hang in the midst of them. And that's by design as well. Um, and uh, this, we're going to get into the story later, but this is kind of, is, we're ebbing up close to that. We have a couple of Sundays before Resurrection Sunday. But uh, we have uh, Isaiah piping in thousands of years ago. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare uh, the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The commendation or the condemnation is found in verse 32 as well, uh, that they were headed for this death sentence. These two men were led to Calvary with Jesus. They'll soon be put to death for the crimes they had committed. One can only imagine the agony of the soul these men felt carefree life of crime had come up to come up to them uh, the description is kind of nebulous as far as um, when I'm thinking about this they they were hardened criminals and they were sometimes criminals come to the end of their time and they realize how bad they were some don't you know so um, the the focal point though is that the Lord Jesus is in between um, and uh, we'll find out as we continue on that Jesus, even to the very end, was concerned about mankind and others as well. Um, now, I claim it's a moving passage. Now, my, my sharing it might not have moved you any, but uh, the uh, taking the time to meditate on this passage and to place yourself there. So, the correct way to place yourself in this narrative would be to take Simon out and put yourself there behind him because he was going to bear your cross. And so you're carrying that cross with him. That's kind of how I started out this passage in my thinking last week, that uh, to be able to really absorb the significance of this passage, we have to kind of understand it from that perspective. The pain and agony of this was uh, uh, carrying this thing that Simeon or Simon, however you want to pronounce it, depending on the spelling. Um, he was able to do it, but Jesus was there in front of him. So all the while he was walking and hearing the crowds and hearing what Jesus had to say might have made an impact in his life. 
maybe the scars from the rough hewn wood on his shoulders that was part of precipitated the story that he had when he took, went home to tell his folks. Some people believe that uh, because of uh, this event, his name would be forever known in biblical history as the man that carried uh, Jesus' cross. And, uh, you know, so as you look at his narrative, I always search for things for application. Because I hear all the time, take up your cross and follow Jesus. But, I, you know, how do, how do I understand? What is the cross thing for us today? You know, how do we do that? You know, in South America, there are people that literally carry a cross or crawl. Uh, they're, they're Catholic folk, uh, most of them, and they will crawl to some place, you know, uh, I guess as a sign of commitment or something. There are some people that actually get pinned up on a cross, the same as Jesus, I'm pretty sure. Um, that happens, especially in South America. Uh, it might happen in other places as well. It's only for my limited reading. Uh, but how do we acquire that uh, understanding to apply in our lives? So what we have to fall back on is uh, the what the Bible tells us about Jesus and how we're to uh, imitate him, and uh, which is really difficult as well because, you know, he was perfect. Uh, so I guess if you were, um, if you were writing notes and thinking, now, if I could, in one sentence, sum up this narrative, what would it be? I'm not going to tell you what you should think for yourself, but for me, I looked at this narrative and I thought, now, here's a perfect picture of what I can picture in my mind as I serve the Lord. Um, carrying the cross would be a difficult task. So when I have a difficult task to perform, in my ministry, I should cry about it. And the embarrassment sometimes would be overwhelming. But in my account, when I get an opportunity to share Christ, that should be the least thing in my mind is being embarrassed because I should expect that. So I'm having a visual picture of this thing. And uh, the end result, when they took the cross off Simeon's back and laid Jesus on that, he was probably still there and uh, saw this, and then heard him on the cross, and watching the people there, listening to the centurion at the end, you know, must have made an impact in his life. And, uh, but I think that it can make an impact in our lives as well. Think about it for a moment. How much time do you have left? So this little bit of time you have left could be could be this month, could be 10 years from now. Uh, but for that moment of time that we have, uh, certainly based on what we have just looked at in the scriptures, should be a catalyst for us to think, you know, I can do better. I can clean my mind. I can have a better focus on serving God. I can deny myself for the sake of others as far as our ministry is concerned. Because I think that's what the Bible is designed for. Some people call it a love letter, which I think it is. But I think also it's a, a, a directive for us so that we can uh, uh, see barriers and go beyond them because we have a greater knowledge of who Christ is and what he did. So when you take it personally, then it makes more sense to me. It, it's different than the uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. You show up, we have a dinner, we, uh, we sing up from the grave he arose. There's my solo for the year. Thank you. But, you know, I always get chills when I sing that song because it's such an impact in our lives. Because of his resurrection, we'll be resurrected. So, um, we only have a vapor left. Let's do something for him. God has sent us to this little church, not just to keep the doors open, but to make an impact in the area that we live. And, you know, if you just live for Christ, that's the beginning for it because people will see a big difference in your life and especially the way the world is today. So let's, let's pray. Father, we're, we're thankful, Father, for the truth of your word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to uh, minister to our hearts to see the more important things in life. And Father, that uh, even this week might have an opportunity to read more, to pray more, and to share more. And to encourage other people as we 
anticipate one day being in your presence. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've got one more hymn to sing. Let's stand and sing, Blessed Redeemer. Thank you. 